Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Hi. This is the second uh, of a two-parter, listener, so head back to last week and check out Ghost Ships Part 1 if you want to get um, the early uh, sense of uh, both... There's two different kinds of ghost ships, right? We talked about it last week. You've got um, literally spiritual ships crewed by dead men. Which could be ghosts or could be skeletons, as we found. Yes, we talked about that with the Flying Dutchman and and also potentially in the aftermath of the SS Valencia, Mm -hmm. um, which was just a a horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also talked about the Mary Celeste, uh, a very mysterious example of the other kind of ghost ship where crew and passengers just vanish without a trace, leaving a boat adrift in the middle of the sea. Yeah, as someone who hates to travel by air, the amount of ghost ships that we've uncovered uh, having to lead to a two-part episode is very distressing to me. So now you don't like the idea of traveling also by sea? Well, we we covered the day the music died. That was a plane crash. Then we went right to uh, uh, ocean tragedies. Um, Maybe we have a subconscious fear of travel after two years in our house. What do you think? Huh. I'd have to talk to my therapist about that. (laughs) Um, Go back, listener, if you'd like to hear about the Flying Dutchman, the Mary Celeste, or indeed the very sad story of the SS Valencia. Uh, That was last week. This week, these are all 20th century stories, and maybe that makes them a little bit more real feeling or a little bit more severe. Um, But I think they're also very interesting. So let's get right into it with the MV Joyita. Hmm. Uh, MV stands for Motor Vessel. So anything with a with an engine, I think, get, can get that classification. Uh, this was an American merchant ship that vanished along with 25 passengers and crew in the South Pacific Ocean in 1955. Hmm. Uh, it's such a mysterious case that it has often been called the Mary Celeste of the South Pacific. All right. So, MV Joyita was a 69-foot up top, my brother, luxury yacht built by director Roland West in 1931, just for private personal use. Um, Joyita means little jewel, and the ship was named for his wife, Jewel Carmen. That's cute. It is cute. Um, I don't think they held on to it for too long. I think he had sold it within like three years. Um, you know, they say that two happiest days of your life are the day you buy a boat and the day you sell your boat. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, and by 1941... The Joyita had been acquired by the U.S. Navy and refitted into a patrol boat for um, trucking around their naval base down at Pearl Harbor. Yes, that's right, in 1941. Oh, boy. So Joyita saw action uh, in the attack on Pearl Harbor and patrolling the base for the rest of the war. And then in 1948, she was sold back into private service, refitted with cork walls and refrigeration equipment in its hold. So that she could uh, transport refrigerated cargo. Cork walls. Yeah, uh, well, cork in the walls. Oh. (laughs) Both as an insulator and because at that point the ship is basically impossible to sink. The whole thing just floats. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. By 1952, it was owned by University of Hawaii professor Dr. Catherine Luamoa. Dr. Catherine Luamala. And she uh, had chartered the boat to her friend, Captain Thomas Dusty Miller, (laughs) who was using it for trading and fishing. So, on October 3rd, 1955, Captain Dusty took the Joyita out of Samoa en route to the Tokelau Islands. That was about 270 miles away. Uh, They'd actually been scheduled to leave the day before, on October 2nd, but the engine clutch on the port side of the boat failed. And uh, so after trying to find a solution for a whole day, um, Captain Miller ended up just leaving the port a day late and on one engine, uh, not having been able to fix the uh, the, the problem. Hmm. Now, I'm terrible at geography, especially when it comes to islands and stuff. What is this near this kind of this area? Oh, it's the South Pacific Islands. So um, I guess think of everything's really far apart down there. Yes. So I don't want to say it's near Hawaii. But that's the part of the world we're talking about. Okay. Um, 
When the ship left Samoa, there were 16 crew and nine passengers aboard, along with Captain Miller. And cargo included medical supplies, uh, timber, various foodstuffs. Uh, there, there was food for the crew, but also they were actually transporting cargo food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 80 empty 45-gallon drums. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if they were bringing those to the tokel, to the islands to sell them, or if they were there just for buoyancy. Um, but the point is, there were 80 empty drums, like oil drums, in the uh, in the hold of the boat. Well, at least we know it's not filled with petroleum or whatever, like the other boat that could have blown up because of that or something. That was denatured alcohol yes. aboard the Mary That's Celeste. Well, well, same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Nothing explosive, nothing too flammable here. And again, you're on an unsinkable boat. Yeah, that usually goes great. So even on one engine, this this should have been... I, I, Dusty figured he could make it. Hmm. On October 6th, the Joyita was reported a day late from the port where she was supposed to have arrived, but no distress call had ever been received. The search and rescue mission from October 6th to October 12th covered nearly 100,000 square miles of ocean. Wow. Because when you get lost at sea, no one knows where you are. Well, it's like the... Um MH370. The oh, the Malaysian plane. Pl- uh, plane, yeah. We I will mean, do an episode on that, I'm sure. We will. It's a crazy story. Um, the Joyita was not found. The search was eventually f- called off, and the Joyita wasn't found until November 10th, five weeks later. Wow. The merchant ship Tuvalu uh, cited, cited her floating 600 miles north of uh, where her course would have been taking her. Because as we saw with the Mary Celeste, a ship can drift quite a long ways without a crew once it's been abandoned. Mm -hmm. When she was found, Joyita was partially submerged and listing heavily. The crew and passengers were gone with no trace. I thought this ship couldn't sink. Uh, Partially submerged and listing. I know what that means, but you shouldn't be able to do that. You can see it. Well, no. If you look at pictures of it, it looks like a ship that ran aground, had some kind of problems, you know, clearly wants to sink (laughs) so bad but it can't sink it's just too buoyant an object Mm -hmm. she was also missing four tons of cargo her logbook all navigational equipment supplies and weapons that were aboard pirates interesting that is one of the theories we're going to bring up later um the radio when rescuers climbed aboard, the radio of the boat was tuned to 2182 kilohertz, which is the International Distress Channel. Mm. But investigators found a break in the cable behind the radio that the person operating it may not have known about, but would have limited their range to about two miles, which in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is exactly jack shit. I feel like that's something you should check before taking off, just making sure everything's good. We'll get to it, but there were a lot of things Dusty should have checked before he took off. Oh, Dusty. The barnacle growth was noted as being high above the usual waterline, meaning the ship had been listing for some time. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, oh, they just left. Um, There was a raised bridge. Uh, You you could see the the picture there. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. See how it's, it's, it's all sort of smashed up, this, this structure on top of the ship. And the canvas awning that had been there, uh, er, there had been a canvas awning rigged on the deck house behind that, like for shelter while people waited or, or something. Meanwhile, the dinghy and all three life rafts from the boat were missing. Um, and here I will note that with the dinghy and three life rafts, that's not enough lifeboats for everyone aboard which is another mistake that Captain Miller made here. I'm not the only captain to make that mistake with an unsinkable ship. Uh, That's very true. Now, the boat was still found to be running on one engine. uh, And it's at this point, investigators realized it had left on one engine. You know what I mean? It's not like Dusty said, hey, guys, I'm only on one engine here. They climbed aboard. They found that the um, port engine's clutch was partly disassembled, like someone had been trying to repair it. And the boat was still running on just one engine. Meanwhile, there was an auxiliary pump that someone had rigged up on a plank of wood between the two main engines. So kind of a jury-rigged pumping system. Um, But the pump had never been connected. Hmm. The starboard engine, the other engine, was running, but it was covered in mattresses. Mattresses just piled up on top of it. Why? 
Um, it is theorized that was to try to keep it dry or as dry as possible as wa- the boat took on water. Okay. Now, all of the electric clocks on the boat had stopped at 1025. And the cabin and navigation light switches were flipped to the on position, although there was no electricity on the boat. So whatever happened must have happened at night. Okay. There was also a doctor's bag on bo- on the deck of the ship, just lying there. Mm-hmm. And inside was a stethoscope, a scalpel, and four lengths of bloody bandages. Ooh. There were still fuel- Saving that for later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just a little snack. <sighs> Um, there was still fuel in the tanks, by the way. Dr. Acula. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, based on the amount of fuel in the tanks, they figured that the boat had made it about 243 miles before being abandoned, which would have put it within 50 miles of its destination. Hmm. After towing the boat back to the island, they found the cause of the flooding and the uh, partial sink. Uh, the raw water, The raw water pipe in the cooling system had rusted and failed. There's another thing you probably should check every now and then, at which point water started pouring into the bilges of the ship. Now, the crew wouldn't have known any of this was going on until the water literally rose above the floor of the engine room. You Mm -hmm. know, the bilges and the hold having been completely filled. Mm -hmm. And at that point, obviously way too late to find the leak. You can go below decks, um, but you're not going to figure out where the water is actually gushing out of. Yikes. (laughs) <laughs> the bilges on this boat were also super clogged to begin with, so uh, even if they, they had gotten that pump system rigged up, it would have been really tough to actually uh, clear the water out of the holds. Is that something that should have been cleaned out before the voyage? Yes. Oh, Dusty. Uh, Dusty went off half-cocked in a lot of ways here. Um, and that could be partly because he was carrying large debts. Uh, after taking Joyita out on a series of long and unsuccessful fishing trips. You lay out a bunch of money, you go out there, you don't catch anything, you come back further in debt, you gotta go do another fishing trip to make the money back. That one doesn't go well either. Now Dusty doesn't have time to lose cargo or passengers, he's gotta get moving. Hmm. The formal inquiry into the incident found the fate of the passengers of the Joyita, quote, inexplicable on the evidence submitted. Um, The main question, uh, sort of like in the Mary Celeste, actually, is why would they have abandoned ship? Uh, hmm. There were 640 cubic feet of cork in the walls of this boat. So was it impossible for it to fully sink? Yes. 640 cubic feet of cork plus the fuel drums were all obviously flotation devices as well. And that leaves you with something that is virtually unsinkable in, in more, not in the way that the, the Titanic was, but because right. this is basically made. Because that sank. <laughs> yes. This is basically made of cork and air at this point. Well, I mean, to be on a, a fully listing ship is an untenable way to be. You can't really do anything except try to balance. And then uh, can you even, could they even like steer the ship, you know, like get somewhere with it Um, at that point i believe when they found her she was still kind of limping along but the one engine um oh no well no the electricity was all dead so yeah yeah when they found her the engine was um dead and i think because of the flooding wasn't going to be able to keep running right so you're just going to be floating there and then no one's responding presumably to their distress calls because Because they they don't realize which i mean they should have just checked the the cables but maybe they're panicked and stuff so maybe you abandon ship because otherwise you're just floating in the middle of the ocean with no one knowing where you are and no way to get anywhere else. Uh, that is one of the theories uh, put forth. Um, but don't forget those bloody bandages. There, there's, there's some weird stuff at play here. Um, the inquiry certainly placed ultimate responsibility for the incident on Captain Miller um, because of the numerous minor faults uh, of of the Joyita that that could and should have been inspected and repaired, uh, leaving port on only one engine into open seas, um, with no working radio, not enough properly equipped. Uh, no, sorry, no lifeboat with proper equipment, and not enough lifeboats for the people. Oh, and Joyita's uh, passenger license had expired <sighs> several months before. I, I, the bandages don't really 
make it obvious that it was foul play to me. I mean, it could be, right? But they, they do make it obvious that someone was injured, though. right? But maybe it's a, a crew person that goes below deck to try and figure out what's going on, slips, cuts themselves on some rusty shit, which obviously was down there. Um, I mean, that could have easily been it, especially if there wasn't any other signs of foul play, like blood on the spattered somewhere or whatever. So here's the problem with just deciding to leave the boat because the boat's stuck. Like we talked about last week with the Mary Celeste, you're going to have a better shot in a a bigger boat. Um, open seas on a life raft yes. is a, an extremely dangerous thing. You're, you're almost certain to either just drift until you die of uh, thirst or um, be tossed over by the waves and, and drown uh, sometime you know, shortly after you set out. If you're all on the deck of the Joyita, I know it's at a 45 degree angle. But if you're all there, you're going to you're going to hang out there. I mean, yes, maybe you do die of thirst. Maybe that still happens. No one's coming and no one knows where you are either way. But what do you solve by getting onto a smaller boat? Well, there's the illusion of having some sort of control over where you can possibly go at this point. But you'd have less control because there weren't enough oars for any of the lifeboats that were there. That's why I said the illusion. Um... So here's some theories. Do you want to know what, uh, you know, investigators bandied about at the time? Mm-hmm. So first of all, and you have to go to this theory first. We did it with Mary Celeste as well. Was this insurance fraud? Could Captain Miller have, I don't know, he would have had to pay all these people off or something. He and had then, to abandon their lot. Li- no. Or murder them, I guess. And then, like, does he kill? All of them walk the plank and then he kills himself. Well, no, then he <laughs> escapes, no, then he escapes and, and through a third party gets his um, his insurance money. He would have to have an accomplice to pick him up at sea, I guess. And that person would have had to keep quiet. I nope. don't know. Here's the problem. Um, the ship didn't sink. So if you were trying to do a sink the ship for insurance money thing, it's the worst ship to pick for that. Yeah. <laughs> and Miller had been operating with this ship for, um, I think a, a year or two, mm-hmm. certainly at least a couple of months. He'd done a couple of fishing trips. He knew this was an impossible ship to sink. And, uh, if you are trying to sink a ship on purpose, you would open all the valves in the hull mm-hmm. to let what water in that you can. Um, all the valves were still closed. Hmm. So it didn't look like sabotage. And also, again, it would have been a real bad plan. So th- this theory was dismissed pretty pretty early. Now, like we said, somebody must have been injured aboard because there were bandages in that doctor kit. Now, it could be a red herring. It could have nothing to do with the actual incident, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe it helps explain the decision to abandon the ship if Captain Miller was the one who was killed or incapacitated. And then they made the choice not knowing that it's a bad choice. You would the be passengers left, and such. You'd be left with panicking passengers and crew who may not have known the boat was unsinkable. They're on a 45 degree listing uh, boat and they, they think they're going to, you know, die there. Could be. Now, there was a first mate on the board who was also very experienced and probably would have known not to abandon this ship as well. His name was Chuck Simpson. Mm-hmm. Um. So it's kind of hard to imagine both men being incapacitated just by chance or falling overboard or something. Um, But if they did, the rest of the people aboard might have gone into the full dumb panic thing. And it is maybe worth noting that Miller and the American first mate on the voyage, Chuck Simpson, um, hated each other. Hmm. Like everyone knew they hated each other. Oh, good thing they worked together. And so it's it's possible, right, that they could have come to blows. Maybe it goes too far. Um, both men go over into the drink, <laughs> and then everyone else is left with, uh, with a sinking boat, not knowing what to do. What do you think? Far-fetched? It seems like a, like a whole series of of bad things to happen. All right. Well, let's tell you, you're right. First we start sinking. Then we fight. Then we fall overboard. Then everyone freaks out. It's a lot of things that have to be in place. You're right. Let's, um, let's, let's stick to more plausible theories. Could it have been the Japanese Navy, Carrie? Well, I mean, initially I was thinking, you know, it's around the time of the Korean war. Uh, that's true. So maybe something involved in that. And then, um, they might have wanted to cover something up if, if and not start an international incident, or we might have wanted to cover something up so we didn't start 
a war about it. So you think like the Koreans had a fleet out there? Well, you know, let's say or the they're Russians. patrolling around or whatever. They see a boat. It was a military boat at one time. Maybe it still kind of looked military. Uh, they fire on it because they think it's like an act of war. And turns out, no. Uh, but, you know, oops. <laughs> <laughs> now what do we do? Maybe an oopsie poopsie. Um, at the they to- definitely would have said oopsie poopsie. Oopsie poopsie. At the time, um, the Fiji Times and Herald said that they had it from an impeccable source, Ooh. in quotes, that Joyita had passed through a fleet of Japanese fishing boats and, quote, had observed something the Japanese did not want them to see, end quote. Over in the UK, the Daily Telegraph hypothesized still active Japanese forces from World War II operating from a hidden base somewhere in the area. Oh. Um, I, now, I think for context, we have to mention that not only was this 10 years after the end of the Second World War, uh, so there's still a lot of tension with that, um, but especially in Fiji at the time, there was strong anti-Japanese sentiment uh, and controversy because uh, Japanese boats... Uh, we're looking for f- fishing rights in Fiji, Fijian waters. And so this theory really had no problem taking root there. Um, it was also helped along by, um, well, actually, while cleaning up the wreck, uh, men found knives that were stamped made in Japan. Uh, but the, those knives were actually like old and broken and probably just from the boat's uh, history as a fishing vessel, not from, um, you know, Japanese naval attackers. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other theories involving violence, of course. Uh, it could be that sea pirates killed the captain, as is always uh, a possibility in cases like these. Uh, killed the captain, the crew, the passengers, and made off with the four tons of missing cargo. In this case, the pirates probably rammed the ship, hence the kind of uh, structural damage. You know, the flying bridge had um, kind of been falling down. and um. Some raised the possibility, you brought up the Korean War, Carrie, and uh, Cold War tensions. Uh, Some raised the possibility that it could have been a Russian nuclear submarine, um, which may sound far-fetched, but uh, this was put forward by uh, the editor of the Guardian newspaper, Jack Thornton, uh, at the time. In 1956, he said, Oh, no, this is not some crackpot theory I dreamed up. I firmly believe the Joyita came upon the Russian submarine ex- unexpectedly in the night. The Russians rammed the Joyita and murdered the 25 passengers and crew members. They purposely left the Joyita afloat to damage American-Japanese relations. The Russians correctly guessed that the Japs would be blamed. Oh, boy. Uh, yes, excuse his uh, 1956 uh, racism. It sounds like, well, in a second here, it sounds like he's a veteran. Um, I discount the Jap murder theory completely. If the Japs were responsible, there was no reason to leave the Joyita afloat. My experience of the Jap has shown he is a very thorough gentleman indeed. That's a weird compliment. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I had to, uh, you know, hopefully that wasn't too, uh, I, don't know. I had, I had to read that. It was, it was silly. It's also possible that the, a mutiny aboard could have led to the abandonment uh, British author Viscount Robert Maugham. Maugham? Maugham. Viscount Robin... Whatever you say. Viscount Robin Maugham uh, later o- owned the Joyita. And sort of as a hobby, I guess, he spent years researching the disappearance, uh, culminating in the book The Joyita Mystery in 1962, where he put down all his findings and his theories. Now, Maugham suggests that after discovering the leak aboard... Um, and, you know, throwing mattresses over the engine and the whole thing. Um, the crew then wanted to turn back, but Captain Miller uh, insisted on pressing on, desperate to clear his debt and make this trip a successful one. Hmm. Um, in the struggle, Miller and possibly Simpson as well would have been injured, and the remaining crew panicked and made the call to abandon the ship and make for a nearby reef or island. Uh, obviously, if this is what happened, then they didn't make it. Yeah, obviously. Um, so there you have it. What do you think happened to uh, uh, Joyita? Was it uh, the Japanese Navy, Russian submarine, cro- um, crooked captain? 
probably with everything that was gone, including the weapons and things like that, and the cargo. Uh, I think it was probably piracy. Yeah, the, that's the big one to me. Is I, I don't think four tons of cargo disappeared aboard the lifeboats, and it doesn't sound like there's... Well, there was barely any room to begin with. Right. Um, yeah, it was probably piracy, and um, they either you know, had everyone jump into the ocean and let the lifeboats go as kind of a deterrent, you know, a red herring, if you will, or um, they let everyone go in lifeboats knowing that they probably wouldn't be found, and they weren't. I wonder why you would bother letting the lifeboats go. Do you need a distraction? You've already... I don't know. Pirates are wily folk. Why not? Sure. Wily Wily for wily's sake. Never a wily make. That's an old pirate saying. I think you made that up. And we'll have more wisdom for the high, from the high seas uh, for you after the break. Arr. Welcome back. When last we left you, we heard of uh, the MV Joyita, a motor ship that uh, vanished in the South Pacific in 1955. It's come to be called the Mary Celeste of the South Pacific, Carrie, and now you know why. One of the other most talked about, most known, I I hesitate to say most popular, um, ghost ship stories, (laughs) uh, where captain, crew, and passengers vanished on the high seas is that of the Carol A. Deering. And this is actually one that has some uh, paranormal connections. Oh, good. So it might play into our wheelhouse in that way. Um, but let's see. We'll see We'll see what uh, what's what. The Carol A. Deering was a five-masted commercial schooner uh, that was found run aground off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, in 1921. Are you sure it's Hatteras? 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 Hatteras sounds better. I feel like it's not Hatteras. I've run afoul of place names before on this show. (laughs) Found run aground off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina in 1921. Now this was a, um, you know, it's a ship, it's a commercial ship. It's for shipping goods, but it was a pretty fancy one. It had steam, heat, and electricity aboard, which was pretty uncommon for a uh, shipping vessel at the time. Uh, the Deering was built in Bath, Minnesota in 1919, and on July 19th, 1920, she arrived at Newport News, Virginia to pick up a coal delivery for Rio de Janeiro. So I think this might have been her maiden voyage. Um, hmm. Unless she took a, a quick one uh, before this. I, I'm not quite sure. A quickie? In, in any case, for first or second, her captain for this voyage was supposed to be William H. Merritt. Uh, he was a man of merit. He was a hero of the First World War. Uh, he'd actually been cited for bravery under fire. Uh, his whole crew was, uh, well, his boat was sunk by a German U-boat, and he uh, saved his whole crew single-handedly. So really, that's the guy you want uh, as you ta- undertake a dangerous commercial voyage. Uh, he brought on his son as first mate and uh, hired a 10-man crew of Scandinavian sailors. Hmm. Uh, on August 26th, the Deering departed for Rio, but it had to turn back not long after because Merritt, the captain, came up ill. Um, they had to scramble to find a new guy, and ultimately he was replaced by 66-year-old retired ship captain Willis B. Warmel. Hmm. And Warmel brought on Charles B. McClellan as his first mate. Um, I don't know if it's because they shared a middle initial or what, but these guys... <laughs> Uh, hated each other fa- famously. I don't There's know. There's only one middle initial that's a B here, and it's going to be me. I don't know why they were working together. Maybe he just couldn't find anyone else um, because of the short notice. But in any case, you had a much less harmonious uh, <laughs> uh, team than the father son road trip movie we were going to get at the beginning. Well, it seems like we're two for two with first mates and captains that hate each other. So maybe that's a sign of tragedy to come and you shouldn't get on a ship where it seems like that's the situation. Oh, maybe nothing tragic will happen. We don't know. It's literally, you just called it a ghost ship. (laughs) (laughs) That's not fun times. 
On September 8th, the Deering uh, departed finally actually for Rio and uh, arrived without incident. Now, well in Brazil, uh, they unloaded their cargo of coal and uh, picked up some Brazilian corn uh, and spent about three months on shore, it looks like. Uh, also well there, Captain Warmel complained to another ship captain, a Mr. Gooden, uh, about basically every member of his crew, apparently, except for the engineer, Herbert Bates, who he said was a good man. It seems like a long time to spend on land. Like, even if you're refueling or you know not ref- but you know what i mean like restocking everything three months is a long time maybe ships need like a lot of a lot of work after to pro- like after a voyage like that and to prepare them maybe i don't know like maybe there's a lot a lot of repairs to be made or or something like that or maybe yeah i don't know it, it seems like a long time but they didn't leave until december hmm. um So he complained about every member of his crew except the engineer, especially McClellan, the first mate, who the captain called habitually drunk while ashore, and who he said treated the men, quote, brutally, totally uncalled for. I don't know if there's such bad blood, just take another guy out with you on the next leg. You mean leave? Or demote him from first mate and get another first mate and just deposit him wherever you go next. Yeah, I think you really need someone who you can tr- like he doesn't like this guy but he can tr- he feels like he can trust him aboard the high seas i guess and i don't that's- know i don't i wouldn't want a pilot and a co-pilot of a plane that hate each other yeah i listen i agree with you i think this is a terrible idea um but they were still together when the deering departed rio for barbados on december 2nd now well in barbados mcclellan got to drinking at a place called the continental cafe and uh, one night, he drunkenly complained to a Captain Hugh Norton that he couldn't discipline the crew without Warmel interfering. So he's not letting me beat him hard enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also said that he had to do all the navigating because Warmel was blind. Great. Um, Norton and two of his crew say they uh, also heard McClellan say, I'll get that, Captain, before we get to Norfolk. I will. Okay. Well, they were drinking at the cafe. So um, he'd also, according to uh, Warmel, he had bellowed at the captain, I'll kill you before it's over, old man. Just before they'd arrived uh, in Barbados. Sounds like a good relationship. Yeah, absolutely. They're, this is going very well. Um, before they left Barbados, McClellan ended up being arrested for drunk and disorderly. Okay, so he was a drunk. Yeah, f- yeah, fully. And not a happy one. <laughs> um, and he rotted in a jail cell for a while, a couple of weeks, it sounds like, until Warmel eventually forgave him or decided he couldn't get out of the country and back to America without him. And on January 9th, Warmel bailed McClellan out of jail and the Deering set sail for Chesapeake Bay. Mm-hmm. Now, the next sighting of the Carol A. Deering was on January 28th by a light ship from Cape Lookout off North Carolina. What's a light ship? uh, A light ship is like a lighthouse that's a ship. So it's a ship that... um, Has a light on it? Yeah, it it, it has a captain or a crew that uh, knows the rocky kind of shoals really, really well and sails around them, um, shining a very bright light and letting um, other ships know not to go there. And also kind of, you know, checking in so you know what the what the ship traffic is like. Mm-hmm. So, uh, to that end, the light ship hailed the Deering. And the captain, uh, whose name was Jacobson, said uh, from the Deering's deck, a tall, thin man with reddish hair and a foreign accent uh, called out to him through a megaphone that the vessel had lost its anchors in a storm off of Cape Fear. And could you please notify the Deering Company? So probably one of the, the Scandinavian guys? Vessel's owner. Yeah, that seems like one of the uh, sailors. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the captain, uh, Captain Jacobson, didn't have a working radio, um, but he did take a note so he could pass it along to kind of the next ship. Um, the only weird that he did say that the crew, the sailors, appeared to be, uh, quote, milling around. On the quarter deck, and the quarter deck is the part of the ship behind the ship's wheel. 
and for I think originally practical reasons, but then evolving into more of a ceremonial kind of a position. Really, only the captain and the flag, and maybe a <coughs> um, high officer, you know, can be in that area. Mm-hmm. So there shouldn't have been sailors just milling around up there. That's weird. Hmm. Um. Anyway. <laughs> Shortly after that, the uh, light ship did pass a steamship, and they hailed them to pass along the Deering's message. They didn't have a radio? They, uh, the light ship didn't have a radio, no. It seems stupid. It does. Well, it says he didn't have a working radio, so it could be that his does was any, busted. Does anyone's ship shit work? Like, uh, d- maybe don't go on the water if your shit doesn't work. To be fair, this is the 20s, so I don't know how good radio <sighs> technology was. Whatever. Now, that crew that he tried to give the message to didn't respond to his hail, um, and in fact, the crew kind of ran out on deck and unfurled a canvas over their nameplate. That's shady. So that he couldn't see what it said. Hmm. Now, that ship turned due east, which isn't the way that the Deering was going, so they could be completely unrelated, but it's just weird and worth mentioning. Sketchy ship. Okay, but he did eventually get this message out because obviously this ship wasn't going to send it out yes the next uh the next ship he saw but um in any case on january 29th another vessel spotted the deering um headed in the direction of diamond shoals Uh, the diamond shoals extend out from cape hatteras and they're a notorious site for shipwrecks Uh, they're actually also called the graveyard of the Atlantic. Yikes. Um, yeah, because of how many uh, ships have met their end there. Well, as we know from our Roanoke episode, it is a very treacherous area to sail in. Uh, exactly. So this ship noted the Deering headed that direction, but um, couldn't hail them because uh, there wasn't anybody on deck. And, um, well, they figured these are sailors, professional sailors. They're, they're, they're going to figure it out. They know that uh, it's a dangerous area. On January 31st, the Deering was sighted again. <laughs> Maybe just tell them, like, you know. Well, but they weren't No on harm, th- no foul. They weren't on the deck. They're just... I don't know. Cruising by. Okay. Maybe call out to them. I don't know. That's weird. I mean, they might not have been on the boat at that point, well, but we'll, we'll get to that. On January 31st, the Deering was sighted again, this time by surfman C.P. Brady from the Cape Hatteras Coast Guard Station. And this time, hard aground on the outer edge of Diamond Shoals. Oh. Um, Rescue ships started operations immediately, but were actually unable to get close uh, for several days due to bad weather, similar to what we saw with the Valencia last week. Hmm. On February 4th, after watching the schooner battered by the surf for a few days, the weather finally cleared enough to get close. Um, The ship was clearly abandoned at this point now the deering's steering equipment had been damaged the specifically the ship's wheel was shattered the binnacle which is the post kind of that you house a ship compass on uh, was crushed and the rudder had been disengaged Hmm. when you see rudder disengaged that doesn't sound like damage from hitting the reef or whatever and i don't see how the wheel would get shattered unless it was like on purpose right yeah, and it, I mean, and we definitely know it happened after the light ship saw them. Yes, because, because that guy would have noticed probably. Them milling around. Yeah. Right. So uh, you think this was kind of a purposeful thing? Yeah, I don't know by who, but that mm-hmm. seems, that's what that sounds like to me. Mm-hmm. The log and navigation equipment were missing, and so were the crew's personal effects, as well as both lifeboats. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was food being prepared in the galley when the ship was abandoned. Were there oars on the lifeboats? Um, yeah, I think the lifeboats were oared, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, they tried to salvage uh, very, you know, the boat both as a, as a whole, get it to the mainland, and uh, take pieces of it away, and ultimately... It had to be destroyed with dynamite on March 4th because there was just nothing else to do with it. Salvage was impossible because the waters are just that dangerous out there. And um, 
the wooden timbers from the wreck after it was dynamited uh, would make their way over to Hatteras Island and the residents there would use them to build their homes in later years. Well, that's very cool. I mean, surefire way to get a haunted house, but still very cool. You're right. Oh, I wonder if there's any good Hatteras uh, hauntings. I'm sure there are. We got to look into that. Mm-hmm. Look out for a possible mini set. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's about, oh, uh, one more thing. About a month after the dynamiting, on April 11th, 1921, a fisherman named Christopher Columbus Gray. Oh boy. Well, you'd have to be a fisherman, huh? Well, he, I assume he had like an anchor tattooed on one arm. Well, you'd have to, wouldn't you? Spent a lot of time looking out over the horizon. Um, what would you say if I told you that he found a message in a bottle? I would say he'd be living my dream Off as a beachcomber. Buxton Beach, North Carolina. Have you ever, 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 have you ever even heard of someone finding a message in a bottle in real life? I absolutely have, yeah. Oh. No one that I know, but I'm in certain beachcombing communities and it happens once in a blue moon. <laughs> uh, well, this guy, Christopher Columbus Gray, said that he found a message in a bottle that said, quote, Deering captured by oil burning boat, something like chaser, taking off everything, handcuffing crew, crew hiding all over ship, no chance to make escape. Finder, please notify headquarters Deering. Wow. Uh, now, Captain Warmel's widow identified the handwriting of the message as Bates, the ship's engineer. And oh, that Warmel actually liked. The guy he liked, yes. And the bottle they confirmed is being made in Brazil. Wow. So, I mean, this is pretty pretty good. But uh, handwriting experts basically immediately concluded the message was a forgery. Oh, man. And federal agents uh, arrested Christopher Columbus Gray. And, arrested him? Yep. And he basically immediately admitted that the whole thing was a hoax. Oh, come on, Chris. He was hoping that the publicity... This is weird. He was hoping the publicity from the message in the bottle would help him get a job at the... Had- Hatteras Light Hat, Hatteras Lighthouse. Huh. He wanted to be a lighthouse keeper. Well, I mean, with jobs nowadays, you know, entry level requires five years of experience. Pff, might as well give it a shot. Is that nautical enough to justify the Christopher Columbus Gray name? That's pretty nautical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's just trying to live his best life. Mm-hmm. Uh, this investigation... I've never heard of this for another incident at sea. This investigation involved five different departments of the federal government hmm. in doing separate like sweeps on this. Uh, the Commerce Department, Treasury Department, just the Department of... Commerce and Treasury is different? Yes. <laughs> yeah, treasury Sounds like money to me. Treasury is the nation's money and commerce is money moving around. The nation? And the Departments of Justice, Navy, and State all looked into the case. Wow. Um, The State Department was interested because several other vessels of uh, various national origin had disappeared in recent days in roughly the same area. Oh. Um, Now, many of those ships had been in the path of a series of big hurricanes, like especially large hurricanes that year in the Atlantic. Well, that'll do it. Uh, That will do it. But both the Carol A. Deering... And another ship, the sulfur freighter Hewitt, had been sailing away from the storms that were in the area. Mm -hmm. And both of them disappeared around January 25th, 1921. The Hewitt was uh, en route from Port Arthur, Texas to Boston. So it would have been around the same area of the Atlantic when it disappeared. Did they figure out what happened to that one? It's never been found. Holy shit. So for a while, it was speculated that maybe the Deering and the Hewitt collided. Hmm. And uh, only the Deering survived, you know, uh, but it didn't really have any evidence of a collision. So there's nothing to actually suggest that happened. But um, anyway, the Weather Bureau, in their investigation, um, strongly advocated a powerful series of Atlantic hurricanes as the uh, cause of the disappearance. Well, of course they would. They're the Weather Bureau. Well, yeah, they don't have pushing. a job if it's not the weather's fault. Well, more funding for next year, sir. These hurricanes are getting bigger. <laughs> um, and again, Deering was headed away from the hurricanes that were in the area. And it, it doesn't appear, also doesn't appear to have been evacuated like in a panic 
Mm-hmm. There was a meal being prepared at the time, so like it probably wasn't a plan. Sure, but I mean, if you're making a meal for all the guys on board, if you're the chef, you're probably just cooking all day. That's Yeah, that's true. Breakfast, and then a few hours to prepare lunch, and then you're just starting dinner after that. So. Right, no point cleaning it up if uh, you're abandoning ship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it, so, I don't know, hurricanes don't seem like the, the, the likely thing here. Um, the U.S. Marine Shipping Board, in their investigation, believed piracy was to blame. Um, and that's also what Warmel's widow believed, because, of course, she bought right into the message in a bottle uh, theory. Hmm. Um, the theory here would be that pirates probably just took the whole ship. Um, hoping to e- use it as a vessel or just sell it, uh, its cargo, whatever, um, at another at a place in time. But then they quickly ran aground, not being familiar with the area. Yeah. Um, there's also a twist on this theory where it could have been rum runners from... Um, the Bahamas. There were liquor smugglers based in the Bahamas at this time, because in 1921, remember... Uh, we are right at the beginning of prohibition in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And um, so that would have wanted to use the boat, or the boat had some rum on it. Yeah, no, the boat's hold could have fit like like a million dollars worth of booze, so it would have been a very valuable um, rum running ship. I guess if you're not caught. Well, yeah, exactly. It's and, not exactly subtle. But these don't; these wouldn't have been smart rum runners because they immediately ran aground. Yeah. Um, however, there's no hard evidence and no suspects for the piracy or the, um, you know, supposed booze bootleggers. Mm-hmm. What about communism, Carrie? Communism is just a red herring. Um, it's, it's a red menace. It's a red dawn. Okay, Swayze. Um, also in 1921, an NYPD raid uh, on the HQ of the, quote, United Russian Workers Party, which was a communist organization in New York at the time. You don't say. Um, allegedly, the raid turned up papers that called on the group's members to seize American ships and sail them to the USSR. Uh, this was waved around by anti-communist hardliners in Congress of the time. Like, eh, this is, uh, look, the Deering was stolen by, uh, by by communists in New York. We've got homegrown <laughs> communist terrorists right here. Um, but it seems a little far-fetched to me. <laughs> just a bit. But again, if they were, you know, just some kind of leftist doofists, wannabe terrorists um, stealing a ship, it makes sense they would immediately run aground, I guess. Uh, But where did everyone go then? Did they kill them? Yes. What happened to the lifeboats? Great question. (laughs) Uh, Oh, probably the communists got into the lifeboats after they ran aground on the reef. Uh Uh-huh. So I guess you could just skip a step and say just the original crew ran aground at that point, right? Yeah, I guess. And why, like, where did the communists' the other boat go? Right. Weird. Now, as far as violence goes, there's also always the possibility, as we've mentioned, of mutiny. And relationships aboard this boat were obviously especially strained. It seemed like a toxic environment. Um, yeah, and you know how the first mate had literally threatened to kill the captain in the last port they were in? Seems like a toxic environment. Yeah, not a great work environment. (laughs) And uh, maybe things turned violent. After all, the man who hailed the light ship didn't appear to be the captain of the boat or even an officer. And the men were hanging out on an area of the deck they really shouldn't have been. So was the cat away, maybe, and the mice playing? Hmm. The investigation was closed in late 1922 without an official finding, although that mutiny theory is the most commonly accepted explanation. Um, But the Carolee Deering is also touted by paranormal fans as one of the most important disappearances connected to the Bermuda Triangle. Yay, Bermuda Triangle. Yay, Bermuda Triangle. Um, for those who don't know, I mean, you probably know, and we'll do an episode on it at some point. Carrie, are you going to do a Bermuda Triangle? (laughs) It sounds like a weird 
Carrie. Sexual thing. Are you going to do a Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> I think I'll certainly tackle the topic at a, a point in the future. Um, just to, so I won't spoil it too much then, but uh, ships and planes, um, notably the HMS Atlanta and the USS Cyclops, if you want to look those up, um, as well as several military and commercial planes have vanished over um, an area um, in the vicinity of Bermuda. A triangle, if you will. A triangular-shaped area. Um, explanations put forth have included magnetic anomalies screwing with people's navigational instruments, um, right through to a time-space tear into another dimension. Sure. Or UFO activity. Absolutely. Leftover Atlantean technology. Why not? Bigfoot. Does he swim? Why Why wouldn't Bigfoot swim? No, he's usually stalking around. Yeah. Hmm. But he's got arms and legs. I mean, he's, 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 I think he could learn. Maybe. Imagine him being like our dog Poe and just knowing how to swim, but not wanting to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, whether it's uh, Bigfoot related or not, do you think uh, the Bermuda Triangle, oh, uh, to explain the connection here, the Deering <coughs> did cut through the area known as the Bermuda Triangle on the last leg of its voyage here. Um, Although several hundred miles from where it would eventually be found. But could it be that the crew or part of it just never made it through the other side? Yeah, maybe the triangle just yeeted all the souls off the ship. I mean, I think they might have, like, I think the light ship might have seen them with the guys on deck after this point. Oh, well, if it was after, then no. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> has nothing to do with anything. But people love it. It's one of the favorite Bermuda Triangle stories. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the mutiny explanation is, is my favorite one because of the, because the sailors milling around on deck. Yeah, but also just the, the you know, bad vibes. And um, this is the 20s. I mean, if, this group of experienced sailors took the lifeboats with their possessions, by the way, which makes sense in the case of them electing to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, they could have even possibly survived, steered to another area, gotten back on land, and then just kind of faded into the woodwork or gotten on another boat back to wherever they were from in Scandinavia. I mean, well, none of them were ever found. But, yeah, but they're also just referred to as yeah, you know, like, do we have 15 their names? Scandinavian sailors. It's just like you know, they probably weren't being kept track of, really. So yeah. they could have easily just gotten on land and gotten themselves to another place and, and never, no one was ever the wiser. So, uh, Or they could have not gotten to land and, and drowned. But I, I think the mutiny angle is... The most likely, I think the que- the real question is if the captain was killed or something like that before this, or if they just left him to rot on the boat, destroyed the steering mm-hmm. wheel so he couldn't move anywhere, and just said sayonara, sucker, and peaced out. And then he, why? To what end? You know, torturing him, <laughs> being shitty to him. Um, I I think it's likely that he probably was already dead if this was the case but i still don't understand why you would destroy the wheel then do you think the sailors killed the first mate and the captain do you think the first mate led the sailors against the captain that's completely open it could go either way probably or the captain could have killed the first mate out of just being pissed off and then everyone revolted on the captain you know it could have gone anyway oh oh, i could see the first mate killing the captain because he did say he was going to and then the first mate had been really cruel to the sailors. That too. Maybe they didn't want to, you know, go with him. So then they, they could have gone that it Ooh, anyway. Double, double mutiny. Double mutiny. All right. Well, I don't think we can end on a higher note than double mutiny. Double mutiny. Uh, let's. We'll we'll be um, we'll be back to say goodbye uh, in a, in a, in a minute. But uh, first, one more little word from our sponsors. We'll see you after the break. Double mutiny. No news this week. 
Uh, I think we all kind of know what's going on in the world right now. Everything is pretty crazy, pretty scary, pretty stressful. And um, we just wanted to send our support and our love and all the good vibes possible to our friends in Ukraine. Um, There's not much else we can do uh, except try and support. And, um, you know, everyone over there has been so incredibly brave and courageous. And, you know, we just want you to know that um, our support is with you. We hear you. And I'm not talking just as the podcast, because who gives a shit what we say. But, um, you know, as as American people, um, you know, I, I hope things get better soon. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people from Ukraine over the last week or so. And uh, so many of them are you know, literally every day, not sure whether people they know and love at home are safe or not because they're uh, taking up arms in defense of their cities or because they're just, um, you know, trying to get to borders. So, yeah, uh, it's it's scary stuff to be happening in the uh, in the 20th, 21st century. Yeah, and we're thinking of you, and um, I don't want to go all thoughts and prayers on this, but I'm not sure what else to do. So uh, that's that's all we can do right now, I guess. Well, it's all we can do. Well, we, this is me and you now. <laughs> yeah, uh, other people could maybe do a little bit more, but yeah. uh, that's not that's, maybe that's not for us to say. All right. Um, well. With that. That's it for our episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. Yes, and come join us on Patreon. A uh, special thanks to our beloved top-tier patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. Thank you, guys. We love you very much. And uh, over on Patreon this week, check it out. We're gonna. There was one story that I couldn't quite squeeze in, and I'm going to tell Caroline about um, in a second here, and you'll only get to hear that part of our conversation over on Patreon. Um, so come join us and hear about Donald Crowhurst and the Ten Myth Electron, um, because that is a ghost story um, that I do find genuinely haunting. Uh, not a ghost story, a ghost ship story <laughs> that I do find genuinely haunting. Um, yeah, if it was a ghost story, you wouldn't give a shit. <laughs> See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media.